All right. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Holly Duke. I'm the Director of Leadership and Engagement at the Ron Brown Scholar Program. I'm the Director of the Ron Brown Leaders Network. Um, welcome to our uh, first program, official program of the Women in STEM program, um, which is our fairly new initiative that is student-run, uh, student-organized. Um, um, our about 125 of you now are in our Facebook group, Women in STEM Across Fields Medicine, Technology, um, STEAM, I guess, which includes the, the arts and entertainment. So um, welcome. We're so glad you're here. What I'm going to do is quickly go through today's agenda, and then I'm going to pass the baton over to our speaker and our moderator today. So what we're going to do in today's session for the next 45 minutes is um, we're going to, first I'll do some introductions for our guest expert, and then we're going to go through a few questions that were submitted for Dr. Ledbetter in advance. And then at the end, we'll have questions from the audience. So for those of you in the audience, if you'll look at your screen, there's a couple of ways that you can ask questions. You can either raise your hand by hitting the little hand icon and I can take you off mute and you can ask your question out loud or you can type it into the chat box and I'll read it out loud for everyone to hear. Um, so like I said, we will do questions at the end. I do have a quick poll that I'm going to go ahead and launch just so we'll see who's in the audience. So if you would look at your screen and answer the question in front of you. The question, uh, Dr. Ledbetter, is just what, what is your class year? Oh, okay. Um, yeah. Okay, so it looks like we have 50% first year students, 25% sophomores, 25% seniors, and of course we know that our own Melanie is a senior. Um, okay. So thanks, thanks guys for answering that question. It's good to know who's in the audience. Um, so first I'm going to uh, introduce Dr. Ledbetter. Um, thank you for being with us, Dr. Ledbetter. This is very exciting. Angela thank Ledbetter is a Ron Brown Scholar, <laughs> originally from Detroit, Michigan. Uh, she has a bachelor's from Xavier University of Louisiana in New Orleans. Uh, she participated in uh, the University of Pennsylvania's pre-med enrichment program for minority undergrads. Uh, she graduated from Wayne State University Med School in 2005. She has a specialization in emergency medicine and has previously served as the center director for Griffles Biomet Plasma Center. But she's now practicing telemedicine, um, which she's going to tell us a little bit more about in a moment. Um, we also have, um, for our moderator today, we have Melanie Grusin, who is your president of the Ron Brown Women in STEM. Melanie, will you introduce yourself and then uh, start with our first question? Yes, so hi everyone. Um, like Holly said, my name is Melanie Gerson. Um, so I will be finishing my last year at the University of Virginia this upcoming spring. I'm double majoring in astronomy and physics and also minoring in German. Um, I just like to say that Holly and Ron Brown have given me immense support in my efforts to make Ron Brown Women in STEM take off and I'm excited to get started with our first webinar with Dr. Angela Webbetter. Uh, so without further ado, let's start with the first question. Okay. Um, so it's really more of a prompt. So I know that Holly has given us a bit of an overview of your bio, but would you tell us more about yourself and how like the overarching career path you've taken? So on the slide it says career tra trajectory. Okay. All right. All right, sure. Well, hello everybody. Glad you guys could come and join us, and hopefully we'll be able to talk a little bit about uh, things that interest you and things that will help you in your career path. Um, I don't have all the answers, but you know I'm here to give you the ones that I do have. But I'm uh, an emergency medicine physician. I was residency trained in Detroit, Michigan. So after that, I went on to work in different emergency departments in Michigan and Texas. I currently live in Texas. So. I really enjoyed uh, taking care of patients in the emergency department. I saw a lot of really sick patients, patients where I was able to sometimes save their lives, turn their conditions around pretty quickly in some cases. I love being around a variety of people, a variety of pathology every day. 
had surprises sometimes. Sometimes there were baby parts that popped out of mom way before expected. <laughs> sometimes there were maggots that were crawling out of ulcers and legs. And sometimes I would walk into a room and there was a body part on one part of the room and the rest of the patient on the other side of the room. So there was a lot to see, a lot to do. Emergency medicine was an awesome place, but ultimately it wasn't the environment for me. Traditional medicine ultimately isn't the environment for me. It definitely has a place in my life, but it's not my true purpose and calling in life. Um, Traditional medicine does have a real drive towards business uh, ahead of quality of care sometimes. So I was the type of doctor where I was always busy trying to be thorough with my patients and take extra time to make sure I got the correct diagnosis, sometimes picking up on problems that other docs missed or trying, just trying to go the extra mile in general with my patients. But that was a bit of a struggle because sometimes my bosses would tell me that I needed to just speed up and move from one patient to the, to the next more quickly. And I know myself, I know that I'm a little bit more slow, a little bit more thorough. Um, so I tried to make some adjustments, but ultimately I just decided that I didn't want to stop caring for patients the way that I thought they deserved to be cared for. I didn't want to make that tra transition to putting people's lives at risk and not practicing the way that I thought I should practice. Um, so I decided to transition into a non-traditional uh, career. Um, I decided that I wanted to do quite a bit of traveling. So I did um, started out traveling, going to different places in the world, staying for prolonged uh, periods of time. And while doing that, I worked as a telemedicine physician. I was able to just see patients and treat them online. Um, and it was pretty, uh, it's been pretty cool because it's flexible. It's not, I don't think my ultimate, uh, ultimate uh, goal, but it does um, definitely serve a, serve a purpose, allows me to continue to treat patients while being gone. But I, I did start to eventually understand my real purpose in life. And I decided to create an organization that addresses issues in the black community from a health perspective. And I'm absolutely loving that. So that's where my career path is going at this point. Um, we use really creative and fun methods to address issues in the black community related to health. So I encourage you all to check it out as well. It's called Ujima Challenge. We'll actually be launching in a few weeks online. So. Just as a little plug there, check it out at ujimachallenge.com. So that's about where, I'm, where I am. Awesome. Um, before we go on to our next question, could you just give us a, a brief, a brief mm -hmm. like, um, a definition of what telemedicine is for those of us who might not know exactly what it is? Yeah, definitely. Uh, telemedicine actually can be practiced in different ways. Uh, some people have their own patient base that they have at their office and they are just able to treat repeat patients from home while they're on the, the computer and talk to them by phone or online. Uh, me personally, I work for a company where I see patients that have acute problems. So patients may call in for their sinus infection or their cold or bladder infection for various things. and I just basically log on to the computer when I'm ready. I look at who's in the virtual waiting room, grab a patient out of there, it's either a phone call or it's a video chat, and uh, basically talk to the patients about what's going on with them. Sometimes uh, we do a little bit of physical diagnosis if we're on video chat. Sometimes I can do things like try to look at their throat and different things like that, but it's mostly a hands-off approach since you're, they're obviously miles away. So it's not as fun as actually being right there with the patient, being able to treat them and touch them and do procedures on them to take care of them. But it is definitely a way to help people that have minor illnesses. We can send prescriptions online electronically. 
it does have its limits though. Sometimes patients aren't so happy when you aren't able to treat their condition over the phone, but you do have to understand that it's a high risk uh, environment. If you are trying to treat patients that are vomiting blood or having serious chest pain, I mean, obviously that's not something you can do over the phone. Even though patients sometimes want you to treat those things over the phone, <laughs> you have to tell them where they need to go in order to get the proper uh, treatment. You have to look out for yourself professionally and also look out for the patients. You know you're, you're not examining them, you're not doing tests on them. If it's potentially anything serious, you can't take the chance that you're going to do something detrimental to the patient. Awesome. So that kind of like leads us into our next question. Mm -hmm. um, you spoke a bit about how you um, enjoy uh, patient care. Is that what initially drew you to medicine or is, is there something else that's additional to that that it drew you to medicine? Well, I can't really say that because I, I really don't know what drew me to medicine. I was so young at the time. I decided I wanted to be a doctor when I was about six or seven. So I didn't know what being a doctor really meant at that time. But at that age, I knew I liked to help people and being a doctor sound really good. So I went with it. Uh, people in my life, like my uncle, my mom, my church family, they always made me feel like I could do whatever I decided I wanted to do. So I decided, hey, being a doctor sounds good and that's what I'm going to do. So <laughs> I kept towards that goal until... I got there. Awesome. Um, you spoke a little bit about how traditional medicine wasn't for you. I think, if I'm mm -hmm. correct, the next question about um, a misconception, misconceptions about uh, med school and entering that in college and stuff that you might have initially thought when you first started your path in medicine and now that you know there's something else that um, were misconceptions. Okay. Um, well, as far as misconceptions about medical school, I would say that a lot of people think that when you get out of medical school that you know how to be a doctor, you know, <laughs> you know everything you need to know about medicine. That's, I would say, probably the biggest misconception. Uh, when you get out of medical school, you're lucky if you know what kind of doctor you want to be. That's about the extent of your knowledge at that point. <laughs> You learn the basic sciences, you learn a little bit about physical diagnosis, you go play around with patients, but ultimately you just lay the foundation in medical school and you just really learn what you need to learn about taking care of patients and treating illnesses during your residency. Um, so did you ask about just the misconceptions of medical school or medicine in general? You know, you can add on to that medicine in general. Um, do you have any things that you've learned that people initially believe about medicine when they enter um, the field? Well, I think most people enter the field with really great intentions, and they enter the field thinking that they are going to be able to do a lot of great, uh, a lot of great things, a lot of good for other people, and that's. Uh, certainly true. A lot of people are able to do great things, uh, but you do learn that medicine changes you a little bit. Um, you have to learn how not to be so emotionally involved with every person and everything that they're going through, every illness they have, because if you get that emotionally involved in it, sometimes it can really drain you. You have to learn that you can only address a certain amount of a patient's problems because if you are there dealing with all of their problems, you will never make it to the next patient that really needs your uh, really needs your time. And sometimes there are limitations as far as management and hospital administration. Some of the restrictions that they put on you are sometimes business related and not necessarily around patient care and it's really no one person's fault that medicine has these limitations and obstacles. I mean, medicine in this country is, is flawed and a lot of people want to come in and do good, but they just have to adjust to that system in order to do that good. So 
I don't want to sound pessimistic at all. I mean, I think medicine is a wonderful field. There's great things going on. You just have to learn the type of practice environment that it is in order to contribute to it. Awesome. That was a great answer. Um, our next question is, um, we, we spoke a bit about some of the, the gross moments that you saw while doing emergency mm -hmm. medicine, um, but what were some of the best moments or even some of the more challenging moments from your early years in practice? Okay. Uh, well, I would say some of the best moments, uh, I think I talked about it a little bit, where instances where you're able to really help someone quickly and turn things around for them. Sometimes you have patients that come in and they are having a hard time breathing. They think they're about to die and you're able to give them medications or treatments to turn them around quickly, have them feeling better quickly. Those are pretty nice, enjoyable moments. But I think at one moment, that's one of my favorite moments in uh, medicine. And it's just, it was just a realization. Well, I knew it anyway, but really seeing that God is in control. I had a patient, I actually call him Lazarus, but I was in residency at the time and I was in the ICU that month and they called us to the emergency room for a cold because patients that cold uh, come up to the ICU if the emergency team is able to revive them. So this particular gentleman, we couldn't resuscitate him, so we pronounced him dead. Then a little while later, we just happened to look across the room and saw that his chest was moving up and down. So we were like, oh, we guess he's not dead. He's back. So <laughs> we went back to check on him and his heart winded up stopping again. He stopped breathing again. So we figured that he had only come back briefly because of the medications we gave him. Uh, but when his heart stopped again, we started back working on him again but we didn't have any success. We had to pronounce him dead once again. Basically, when people get medications and CPR to bring them back to life, sometimes the heart stops beating again for a brief time, and then it stops once that medication effect runs off. And you don't necessarily want to keep resuscitating these people because their brain has been deprived of oxygen for so long that the fear is you're going to bring back someone who's going to be brain dead, they're going to be a vegetable for life. So. Uh, we didn't want to do this to this man. We didn't want to turn him into a vegetable. So we decided that, you know, if his heart stops again, we're not going to keep resuscitating him. You know, we're going to, you know, let him go. So we started doing other things that we needed to do. We were still in the same room, though. And again, we looked up and saw that there was rhythm on the monitor. His heart was beating again. He was breathing again. But we figured, okay. He's back again, but this probably isn't going to last. Once this medication wears off, his heart's probably going to stop again. But it, it didn't. It kept going. I came in the room the next morning to the ICU because I was uh, in, during my ICU rotation. And as soon as I walked in the room, he looked at me and said, what happened? So I was, I was a little taken aback because I expected him to be doing pretty bad and not able to talk to me <laughs> at the moment. So... He wasn't ready to do jumping jacks or anything, but he was literally in the same condition that he was in before this, any of this happened. So that's when I just knew that we were just vessels for God's work and God has the final say. So that was a pretty, a pretty awesome. That's a, wow. Experience. Wow. That is, that is an amazing, I don't know. I, I don't even know what my reaction would have been to being inside <laughs> that, that room. Um, yeah, no, that that's just something that you would have to see it yourself to almost even believe it. Um, yeah. 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 Well, I mean, we've already sped through the the first four questions, but we're we're on to our final fifth question. Mm -hmm. um, and and that's um, what are some alternative careers for someone who decides that med school or the traditional practice isn't well suited to them? Well, there's a ton of options, and I really think people have to experience different things to find out what works for them, what doesn't work for them. There's awesome careers in medicine all around, whether it's being an ultrasound tech or whether it's being a radiology tech, whether it's being a physical therapist or respiratory therapist. I mean, there's options for days, but 
I do think that public health is a great field, and particularly uh, there's a real need for great people in hospital administration and healthcare policy. Uh, getting a healthcare management type of degree and working as academic and legislative policy advisors, I think, is very important. We need to improve some of the laws in the country, improve the way some hospitals are ran. We need to improve uh, some of the academic institutions. So I don't know a lot about the fields, but I just think there's a lot of need for great people to be advisors to legislators and running healthcare institutions. So um, these are things to consider when you start thinking of, thinking about your uh, careers. And even people who have already had experience in clinical medicine, it's great when people who have clinical experience can get into some of these roles and make some of these laws and make some of these decisions in higher positions. Uh, because sometimes people who are making those decisions don't have that clinical experience. So I just encourage everybody to pursue their passions and just start experimenting with things to figure out what works for you. Yeah, and it's also great to, uh, to always figure out something that you, you might not like. It's always good to be able mm -hmm. to like try something and then figure out later that, oh, that might not have been what's right for me, but I still enjoy the field. I still enjoy medicine. And then right. there's so many more paths out there for a person um, or an incoming student to take that doesn't completely take them off of that path. Right. And then you learn something in every path that you take. So it's not a waste of time if you've gone down a path that isn't necessarily for you. Yeah. Well, that, that was our last question. I know um, the next one opens it up. Do um, you want to take it, Holly? Yes, yes, um, and I was just going to um, insert that here in Virginia, we just elected a physician as our governor. So Ralph North, really? yeah, really? our governor-elect is awesome. a pediatrician. He is, and he actually still works in free clinics, um, okay. like mobile clinics in uh, rural parts of the state that don't have good access, like Bristol, Virginia. Uh -huh. He still works. He still volunteers in mobile clinics. So yeah, our next governor is a is a physician. Wow, he's uh -huh. been a busy, busy man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So hopefully he'll he'll have he'll have the wisdom to to make a difference. So um, we already have a question on the board, and I'll ask, and I'll get to it in a minute. But for um, for those of you who are tuning in live, if you want to ask a question yourself um, for Dr. Ledbetter, uh, you can ask anything, and uh, she'll answer if she can. Um, and we'll it will take uh, we'll we'll take a few here for the next few minutes. Um, I do want to also say that if you have to hang up now because you have to go to class or you're off to a meeting, you're not going to hurt our feelings. So it's okay to, <laughs> to sign off if you need to, but we will take questions. Um, so the first one comes from Tiffany, and she has a question about the Ujima Challenge. How do you spell Ujima Challenge? It's uh, U as an umbrella, J as in Jerry, I as in India, M as in Mary, A as in Apple. All right. And you yeah. said it's going to be well, up in a few. I'm excited about it. I'm happy you want to know about it. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. All right. And, we'll, and you said that's going to go live in a week or two? Yeah, in a few weeks from now. So um, look for it at the um, end of uh, December. Okay, we'll put it on the Women in STEM page when it, really? when it goes oh. live. Oh, yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, so then Bobby has a question. Uh, Yes. Uh, can you talk about the med school environment? Did you find it to be encouraging? Um, we know it's a lot of tough work, but um, what tips do you have for getting through? Well, the medical school environment, um, I think it depends on where you go, how supportive it is and everything, but regardless, it's going to be tough. Med school is hard. You have to digest a lot of information in a very short amount of time. So I think the most important thing to know about the medical school environment is that you have to figure out how you fit in and how you can accomplish your goals in there. You have to figure out your learning style really because I know for me I didn't I didn't really have to work hard in high school or college. Studying pretty much came easy to me. I didn't really have to study that much to get good grades and to do well there. But when medical school came, medical school was a beast, and I had to figure out my learning style really quick. So 
Um, what I did was I got the recordings of the classes um, and I stopped going to class and the recordings at that time were cassette tapes so you know I, I, I'm uh, getting a little older but I would listen to those <laughs> tapes and I would rewind when I missed something and I would uh, be able to look things up that I didn't understand so reading is not really how I learn I learn better by listening to recordings or watching lectures that I can rewind um, again and again. So I would just say that the medical school environment is somewhere where you have to figure out your own learning style. I think that's very, uh, very important. And you always have to do a lot of repetition, whatever your learning style is, go over and over the material as many times as you can just to make it stick. But... Um, thank you. That's a that's good wisdom. Will you, uh, Tiffany also wants to know um, if you'll talk a little bit about being a, a minority in medicine. How How is it, she asks. It's, I mean, on the majority of the time, it's, you, it's fine. And there's great moments where there are people, the patients that you have that, you know, look at you and are inspired to see that there is a woman, there's a black woman that's their physician and, you know, they're very excited. Oh, can you give me your car where you practice? And I have to explain what emergency medicine really is that, you know, we don't have offices, you know, we don't see patients on a daily basis, but we're here when you really need us. So it's great when people are able to see you because black women are only 2% of physicians in the country. So that's great. But there are other moments where people don't want a black doctor. I, ha I haven't had very many of these experiences, but I have had the experiences where patients say, you know, they don't want a black doctor. Uh, well, this is the emergency department and you don't really have a choice. So you can stay or you can leave. It's really up to you. But um, there are tons of times where I'm never the doctor, the white male technician that's assisting me in the procedure, assisting me taking care of the patient. He's usually the doctor to a lot of patients. They'll call him doctor. I'll take care of them and when I leave the room they'll say, hey, where's where's that uh, that nice nurse? Can you ask her to come back? Or I'm, you know, I'm always a different position than the physician in the eyes of the patients a lot of times. So there's highs and there's lows to it. Hmm. But it is uh, actually pretty helpful to be connected to uh, groups that are uh, similar, uh, have similar situations to you. I'm, I'm part of a Facebook uh, group um, that is c comprised of minority females and we're able to be a support to each other, share stories and things of that sort. So that's helpful. Great. Um, well, that is it from the audience end, um, unless, audience, do you have any more questions? Going once, <laughs> going twice, <laughs> and what I'll do is um, I'll put my uh, email up on the screen, so if you had a question and you didn't want to ask it out loud um, and you want to you know, submit it privately, you can, um, and that's fine, um, and I'll just go ahead and I'll just plunk my email up. Yeah, I'd definitely um, be willing and, to answer those questions. <laughs> yeah, that's perfectly fine. And while I do that, uh, Dr. Leviter, do you have any final thoughts for this group of young hopefuls before we send them off into the wilderness? <laughs> well, I just encourage everybody to experience as much as they can uh, when you're deciding what you want to do in life. Sometimes it's a lot different than you actually think it is. So try to ask people if you can shadow them, if you can come to work with them one day, if you can talk to them about what they do. So, and don't necessarily just stick to exactly what you think you want to do. Whatever your strengths are, whatever your passions are, think about those things and try to, try to find someone who is doing something like that and try to shadow them and ask them questions. But ultimately, you want to find your purpose in life and even if your purpose is different than what's traditional, be willing to explore that and find out what your real purpose is in life. 
Well, thank you so much. This was this was eye opening. Um, I learned something. Melanie, did you learn something? I learned so many things. Yes. Thank you so much <laughs> for joining us today. Are there any uh, people in the audience that are applying to medical school? Um, I could have. I should have put that as a poll. Um, is anyone, if anyone's on the line, uh, the question on the question Dr. Ledbetter is asking is, are, is anyone um, in the process of applying? You can type your answer in the chat box right now, and we'll give you a moment to do that. Um, and maybe not okay. this early because I think we had. Uh, oh, let's see. Yeah, Carly says uh, Kayla is, is applying in June of 2018. Okay. Well, it was, I just asked because there was one thing that I remember just from applying to uh, medical school was that the people who stood out, I think, were the people who had different majors and different interests that were a little different than everybody else. When I applied, a lot of people were science majors, specifically biology. So people who had a different major or people who had extracurricular activities and hobbies that they explored and excelled in, I think stood out to people. So just when making sure you're pursuing those things that really interest you and if any of those things are happening, make sure you uh, feature those on your application and really refer to those just to make yourself stand out a bit. Great. Thank you. Bonus advice. Um, <laughs> Okay, well, it's um, it's 4:30, so I will um, I'll go ahead and wrap it up. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Ledbetter. Um, no um, problem at all. We have some people commenting on the board now, just to say thank you and that you gave great advice. Aww. We wish you the best and that you look super cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for it all. Thank you for it all. <laughs> I also have been admiring your earrings, so I'm glad someone else was thinking it. Thank you. I think um, they're common trolleys, probably. That's where I get most of the jewelry. It's all costume. Awesome. And I don't buy it. Oh. <laughs> all, right. all right. Triple bonus wisdom. Um, <laughs> Uh, so thank you again. Thank you, Melanie. Um, everyone have a great night, and uh, we look forward to uh, checking out Ujima Challenge in a few weeks. Well, great. Thank you. You're welcome. Good night, everyone. I'm gonna. I'll, I'll go ahead and end it now. Good night. Good night. Bye.